Wednesday cereal is not gonna like this. Hello everybody, it's me, Ghost Critic, and welcome back if you've just finished watching my main comic book review video for Friday. This, of course, is my pick of the week separate video, and you already know what it is, you've seen the title already, and I have to say, I surprised myself that I chose this as my pick of the week. I am, of course, talking about new issue one from Marvel. It is Star Wars. Now, let's get a couple of things out of the way straight away. Now, it's back at Marvel. Who cares? It could be, it could have Boom Studios on there. It could have Dynamite Entertainment logo on there. I don't care as long as what's inside tells me a good story. I don't care what corporate logo is on the side of it. Forget it's a Marvel book. Now, it is £4.99 and I appreciate that is a steep price for some to pay. It is a thicker book. Some may say they've cheated on a couple of pages. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and you can afford what you can afford. Uh, you know, I've bought 4 99 books before and I thought they were just terrible and what a waste of money. But fortunately I had that money to uh, spend on it so it's all on me. You can't blame uh, Marvel for putting the 4 99 on a book that's got more pages in than a regular one. And it's a first issue. That's all I'm going to say about that. But let's actually get into the comic book. And oh, the shivers I had right from the very beginning. The first page, that kind of iconic first line, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And then you turn the page over and you get this double page of the original Star Wars logo. You turn the next page and you have, again, those iconic scrolling credits telling you uh, what has just happened in the kind of story-like way. You could almost hear inside your head the Star Wars theme building up and it just set the tone for this book perfectly. Um, before we dig into the actual story, a lot has been asked, is this new reader friendly? And I'm going to use something in Britain we have or had was uh, a radio show that turned into a D TV show called I've Never Seen Star Wars. And it was a kind of camp a comedy talk show where the host would uh, interview a celebrity and get them to ex have new experiences uh, of things that are really much more commonplace to a much larger audience. And so I think with Star Wars, pretty much everyone must have seen the at least the first one. Or they've seen clips of it. They know, at least know the characters. Um, so you're not, no one is ever, I can't imagine going into uh, a Star Wars comic book completely blind, not knowing what they are going to be expecting. As it's a comic book, as it's under that kind of geek culture, if you're reading comics again, I think the majority of us have seen Star Wars. So, is it new reader friendly? I'd say yes, because I don't think there are more new people that haven't seen Star Wars than have, if that makes any sense. But what's going on in the book that made this my pick of the week and got me so excited to choose it as that? Well, we have the Rebels fresh from their victory in blowing up the Death Star, happened at the end of the first movie, A New Hope, and they are now making bold moves across the universe uh, with attacks against the Empire to keep that momentum going. And this is one such mission. Um, we have 
and it is headed by a kind of slew of very familiar faces. It is, of course, the ones that you know and love. You've got Luke, you've got Han, you've got Leia, there's Chewie there, there's R2, D2, there's C3PO, um, there's Chewbacca. They're all there, they're all familiar faces, and it kind of eases you in. You're not seeing anyone that you're unfamiliar with. Um, of course, they're there to take down this um, big, this big weapons factory of the Empire, um, and they're using the kind of a kind of negotiation meeting uh, that they thwarted and uh, taken over, pretending to be an envoy of Jabba the Hutt. Already, you have connections um, to the movie uh, with Han and Jabba. Um, so there are kind of tiny little kind of Easter eggs kind of thing in there um, for for the film buffs in in this comic. Um, of course, everything looks like it's going swimmingly well, but you know before you even get there that it's not going to be a smooth ride and everything kind of goes to pot. And of course, with the introduction of Vader being the negotiator for this supposed weapons trade, you know things are going to kick off. Um, I think they've been incredibly astute using John Cassidy as their first artist on this book. He has a very realistic style um, and it has a very kind of filmic cinematic style at the same time. Um, the, the, this doesn't have a comic book feel um, they've like I said they've used an artist who who creates the character and they do look like they do in the movies there's a couple of times when Luke doesn't quite look like he should do um, if like you say it's based on the characters of the movie but I kind of let that slide because I knew who it was the one thing that I do miss and it kind of goes back to right when I started at the very first pages when I could hear the theme music coming in. But that it's more to do with the sound effects. You get Luke using the lightsaber and you just want to hear that kind of the sound of it coming on and it whooshing through the air. And while I can almost hear it, it's not, you know, kind of the true sound it's my version of it and it's never going to be anywhere close and that's the only thing that's missing the roar of Chewbacca um, the kind of all, all the characters kind of voices unless you're very good at doing impersonations uh, I, I do kind of miss that and that's the only um, for want of a better word flaw of this book but it is, in essence, a great nostalgic feeling book for any um, Star Wars fan, uh, young, old, however much your experience of the Star Wars universe is. It was a cracking read and I loved it to bits. Now, I know Matt had uh, a few problems with it and I can understand his point about because this takes place between A New Hope and uh, The Empire Strikes Back and the time between those, how far can you really stretch that story out? And I think he may be talking a little bit too far ahead of himself because I don't know, maybe he's got some insider knowledge, I don't, but we don't know that these, these stories within this new series is going to be focused entirely on these characters. I'm sure they will play a huge part in however long this series lasts. But as with um, the Dark Horse books, while yes, they were set much further in the future after... Um, after the uh, the trilogy, and so they could create new characters, but they did that. They they chose often chose characters that were lesser known and followed their journeys uh, rather than sticking just to our kind of like he said the main kind of nine or ten characters that we know from Star Wars. So and that is always the problem with any kind of TV or movie tie-in with a comic book. It was the same with Buffy. Um, it's the same with the X-Files comic. It's the same with uh, what else? Battlestar Galactica, the Star Trek. 
are these comic books part of the canon? How much can they do with the comic book without treading on the film's um, kind of canon of history? Um, and I know because I started picking up the Star Wars book when it came at Dark Horse, the last series written by Brian Wood, and I really couldn't get into it. Uh, I think it was because there was a lot of characters that I didn't know, and I wanted those familiar faces much more to the forefront than they actually were. So I had a cracking time with this. I am on board with this. On next Wednesday, I'm going to be putting this on my pull list and I am going to enjoy the heck out of it.